Hi, everybody. I'm Ken Stern. I'm the director of the Bard Center for the Study of Hate. And it's my pleasure uh, to have David Kurtzer and John Palakowski with us today talking about David Kurtzer's new book. The way we're going to do this is uh, David is going to talk for about 10 minutes or so, and John is going to then be in conversation with him, and then we'll turn it over to Q&A, probably about 40 minutes, give or take. Um, and what I invite people to do is to put uh, questions, you don't have to wait until the end of the uh, talk to put in questions that you might have and I will moderate them uh, at, at the end. So let me start off with just the introductions of, of David and John. David Kurtzer is the Paul Dupuy uh, University Professor of Social Science at Brown University. His latest book, The Pope at War, The Secret History of Pius XII, Mussolini and Hitler, uh, which we're talking about today, is also actually being published in Italian, German, Spanish, and Chinese. And his previous book, The Pope Who Would Be King, uh, was termed richly rewarding by the Christian Science Monitor and a rock solid history with enough intrigue and double dealing to compete with any Robert Harris thriller by the Seattle Times. And it tells the dramatic story of the Roman Revolution of 1848 when the Pope was driven into exile and the end of the papal theocracy was proclaimed. His Pope and Mussolini, The Secret History of Pius XI and the Rise of Fascism in Europe won the Pulitzer Prize for Biography in 2015. And this introduction would take too long if I mentioned all his other books and articles, so I won't. Uh, David is an authority on Italian politics, society, and history, political symbolism, and anthropological demography. He's the past president of both the Social Science History Association and the Society for the Anthropology of Europe and is the co-founder and served for many years as the co-editor of the Journal of Modern Italian Studies. Uh, I met David uh, when, I, when he was the provost of Brown and I was working for the American Jewish Committee and gave a talk uh, there. And what I was pleased to learn is David's father, Morris, who he mentions at the very end of his book, uh, also worked at AJC. And we didn't overlap, but I looked at the archives today and I saw that we actually worked with some of the same people, Morris Fine and some many others. So I also found one paragraph from the archives uh, that I'll mention from March of 1958. It was a report on its mass media education committee. And it says, Passover TV program featuring Dr. Morris E. Kurtzer, AJC's Director of Interreligious Activities and his family. Conducting a Seder service will be telecast by WCBS over a nationwide hookup on Sunday, March 30th. Ms. Kathy Pike, daughter of Dean James A. Pike of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine will be the guest. So David has worked for many years in the field of intergroup and interreligious uh, activity. And that's one of the first examples of it that I saw in the archives. And I'm so delighted that he's in conversation with John today because it makes perfect sense to have this interreligious conversation. Uh, John Palakowski is a member of the Order of Friars Servants of Mary and was ordained at the University of St. Mary in the Lake. One of the founding ma faculty members of the Catholic Theological Union, he served on the faculty from 1968 until his retirement in 2017. He's been an active participant in Christian Jewish dialogue as well as the wider interreligious dialogue for nearly 50 years. He served for six years as president of the International Council of Christians and Jews and has served several terms on the board of the Parliament of the World's Religions. He was deeply involved in the development of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington and served four terms on its board by presidential appointment. On the social ethics front, John has worked with the Office of Justice and Peace at the National Conference of Catholic Bishops on its energy statement and its pastoral letter on, of the economy. He's been a participant in three United Nations international conferences on world peace, on alternative energy, on human trafficking. He's won many awards. Um, and as I mentioned, I met him too through my work at AJC. Uh, and when we had a founding conference of the field of hate study at Gonzaga University in 2004, I asked experts from many disciplines to talk about how their area of study uh, looked at hate. And John spoke brilliantly about religion in his article uh, that resulted in the Journal of Hate Studies as must reading. And I also thought about 
looking at the AJC archives today, and I found an entry from about him too, uh, from 1973. And this was part of a memo uh, that said, you are urgently requested to bear witness to your concerns for Soviet Jews when Brezhnev comes. And it says, when Brezhnev, the head of Russia, visits the country on June 18th, he will be welcomed as a visiting head of an important state but he must also hear and see responsible indication of great concern for Soviet Jews. Then it goes on, if the Jewish community meets in the meadow office at the White House for a National Assembly of Concern, the task force, which John was one of the leaders, urges Christians to join in this public witness. If prominent citizens are asked to join the daily silent vigil opposite the USSR embassy, the task force calls on Christians to be part of this response to conscience. So I can't think of two better people to talk about uh, the subject that we're talking about today, uh, David's book uh, and the implications, uh, not only for history, but for Jews and for the world. And I leave it to the two of you to have a conversation. I'm really looking forward to listening to it. Well, thank you. Uh... Thank you, Ken. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks to your Center for the Study of Hate for organizing this program. And thanks to John, especially for uh, participating with me as we talk about my recent book, which just came out a few months ago, uh, Hope of War. So I, I just thought uh, I'd spend a few minutes giving you some idea of what the book is about, not try to summarize its content, but also uh, why I wrote the book, um, which has to do with a, a great controversy, one of the greater controversy certainly in the modern history of the church uh, and perhaps even in uh, 20th century European history. The question of during the World War II and the Holocaust, the attitude taken by the Pope at the time, Pius XII and more generally by the Vatican as the war raged and as the, the Holocaust proceeded. Uh, my own interest in part goes back actually since Ken mentioned my father and that uh, televised uh, Seder, which they brought the cameras into our home in suburban New York. Um, I'd like to sometimes say I sang for a national audience when I was 10 years old, which is when I said, sang the four questions on that uh, CBS transmission. Uh, fortunately, I haven't sung for a national audience or much of anyone else ever since. But um, so that I, not only was my father involved in religious activities, but he had been the Jewish chaplain at Anzio Beachhead uh, in 1944. So the, when Rome was being held by the Germans, who at the time occupied much of the Italian peninsula, uh, the allies landed troops in about 30 miles south of Rome at the Anzio Beachhead. My father was a Jewish chaplain there, and he was with the troops as well when in early June, 1944, they liberated Rome. So I grew up with, with stories about the war and, and Rome and, and Italy. But the controversy over Pius XII has certainly had very high profile. Uh, probably the public involvement, you might say, and interest in this it might uh, be dated to 1963 when a German playwright, Ralph Hachuth, uh, produced a play uh, called in English, uh, The Deputy, uh, which essentially castigates the, the Pope for his silence during the, uh, the Holocaust, his failure ever to denounce the um, Nazi attempt to exterminate the Jews of Europe, and has a, a younger priest calling on the, the Pope to speak out and the Pope uh, refusing to do so. Uh, more recently, about 20 years ago, I think 1999 or so, there was a book published by uh, the Britisher John Cornwell with a provocative title, Hitler's Pope. Um, and which basically continued along this thesis. Meanwhile, this produced a quite strong reaction from defenders of Pius XII. Uh, the Pope at, at the time, or time of the initial controversy in the 60s uh, was Paul VI, and he commissioned a group of four Jesuit scholars to uh, go through the archives of the Vatican, which were not open to other scholars, and select out the papers that were judged to be relevant to this issue of how the Pope, uh, what he knew about what was going on in World War II and the Holocaust and how he dealt with it. And they were published in kind of 12 thick uh, volumes of including you know, thousands of many thousands of pages. Uh, those were published back in the uh, later 60s and, in, and through the 70s. Uh, but there have been these demands uh, ever since the controversy began for the Vatican to open its archives and uh, the Vatican hadn't done so. Um, 
I mean, in their defense, one might say, if you look at other archives, often there's a you know 100 year rule or 75 year rule and so on. And these uh, could be said to have been too recent. Uh, but in any case, there was great pressure, partly from Jewish organizations to open the archives, especially for uh, the, the Second World War period. The, I kind of made it then, I had done an earlier book, uh, Ken alluded to about the predecessor of Pius XII, Pius XI, who was Pope from 29 to 22, rather, to 39, and about his relations with the Italian fascist regime. And so in a way, it was kind of a logical extension to then look at his successor, but it had also been his number two, because the man, Eugenio Pacelli, who became uh, Pope Pius XII, the controversial Pope Pius XII, had been Secretary of State in the 30s to his predecessor, Pius XI. Uh, but I kind of made a bet uh, shortly after I finished that earlier book that Pope Francis, as part of his effort for more transparency, uh, would finally authorize the opening of those Vatican archives. So I began research in a series of other archives that are very important for shedding light on this history. Uh, the Italian fascist archives, the Italian government archives for World War II, the German archives, uh, the French archives, the uh, British and American archives. Each of these countries had an, uh, an ambassador, an envoy to the Holy See, to the Vatican, and they were sending reports back to their governments in, in Rome, in Berlin, in London, in Vichy, uh, in Washington, uh, almost on a day-by-day -day basis, reporting what the people around the Pope were saying, what the Pope himself was saying in their uh, meetings, occasional meetings with the Pope. Uh, so I was lucky in that I finished basically digitizing tens of thousands of pages of documents from those other archives when Pope Francis announced in uh, 2019 that he was authorizing the opening as of uh, March 2nd, 2020 of the archives for the papacy of Pius XII. Uh, so I was in uh, Rome planning to spend several months there uh, March 2nd at the opening, uh, along with some other colleagues from uh, mainly from Germany and Italy. And uh, when they opened, the problem, as some of you may recall, was this is kind of the beginning of the COVID epidemic, and Italy was the center, at least outside of China. So after just one week, they closed, and we worked there intensively for one week, but then they closed the archives. Uh, turned out for three months. But the archives were reopened in June 2020. And uh, thanks in good part to my colleague who works with me, Roberto Benedetti, who is not only a historian uh, and an expert in this history and in these archives, but also is Roman and lives in Rome. Uh, so despite the COVID situation preventing foreign researchers really from traveling to this period, he was able with the uh, reopening to uh, work there. We'd be in, in daily contact and he, in, in the end, uh, I ended up with about 8,000 pages of those newly available Vatican archival documents digitized, <clears throat> and uh, I was able to use for my book. Uh, but I would, I would mention a lot of emphasis, understandably, is in, um, placed on the recently opened Vatican archives. What I found necessary and important was what I think of as triangulating documents from these different archives. and. <clears throat> six different countries if you count Vatican City as a country uh, around the same event. And so my book uh, tries to do that, to bring together materials, archival firsthand uh, information, insight from all those different archives to recount in a way that would try to also um, interest a larger readership, not just an academic one uh, in this history. And I'll just say, finally, by way of introduction, there were some who said that, you know, after the publication of those 12 volumes by the Vatican of the documents from World War II, Vatican documents, that there wouldn't be anything really new to be discovered or to be said uh, with the opening of the Vatican archives. Uh, I think in my book, I show that uh, this is certainly not the case. And just to give one example, uh, I discovered that uh, the Vatican had been able to keep essentially secret for 80 years until my book came out, the fact that Hitler, uh, within weeks of Pius XII's uh, election, so it's seeing an opportunity and not having gotten along with Pius XII's predecessor, decided to send a special secret envoy to negotiate with the Pope, which he did over the next uh, many months, uh, a, a Nazi prince who was in fact married to the daughter of the King of Italy. So it's a very kind of cloak and dagger uh, sort of affair. Uh, as well as a tragic one in various ways. So 
Um, I look forward to our conversation and I couldn't think of a better interlocutor uh, than John Polakowski for discussing these questions. Well, thank, thank you, David, and thank you for this really monumental uh, study of the um, period, uh, particularly focusing on the uh, relationship between the uh, church leadership in Rome uh, under Pius XII uh, and the, um, uh, the Mussolini government and so on, which I think is something that is not as well known uh, to many people in this whole discussion about Pius XII. Um, I, I would just begin by saying that um, uh, I think you captured, in fact, you, you use language at one point in your book that's very similar to what was said to me uh, kind of off the cuff by the late Cardinal Francis George here in Chicago. Now, Cardinal George uh, and I were not um, entirely um, on the same wavelength in terms of uh, Catholic theology, Catholic general perspective on Catholicism. But in a conversation, private conversation, extended conversation that we were having on a number of topics, he brought up Pius XII very briefly, uh, but he said um, his problem with Pius XII was that the church needed a prophet and we got a politician. Uh, and in a sense, I think you, if I recall somewhere in the earlier part of the book, you said something almost exactly the same. Um, and you have to understand, I think if you, if you don't understand the family history of Pius XII, uh, you are closing off an important ven uh, avenue of understanding why he did what he did when he was Pope. Uh, he grew up in a, in, in a diplomatic family. His father was uh, served for many years as an Italian diplomat. Um, his father was beside himself over the loss of the papal states and the loss of um, the church's political power uh, after the uh, demise of the papal states. And I mean, he was somewhat consoled by the uh, uh, reestablishment of the Vatican mini-state uh, in 19, what's 1929, um, but that was far cry from what the uh, church was under, uh, in terms of po what the political power the church had in uh, when it had the papal states. Uh, and so I, I think the, um, his whole training, uh, as a priest uh, involved a great deal of involvement with political issues. He had very minimal pastoral experience. Uh, shortly after ordination, he went to study in the school for papal diplomats in, in Rome and so on. And I, I think really, uh, you know, when you say that um, uh, the Pope, uh, the church perhaps needed a more prophetic figure, which many would say uh, Pius XI would have served that role far better than Pius XII did. Um, you can't prove it because he died uh, before, in, in a sense, before the, uh, the real uh, uh, destructive phase of the Hitlerian vision particularly towards the Jews really commenced. Um, but the, um, and, and you know, whether he would have had an entirely different perspective on the Jewish question, I'm not sure. Uh, I think generally speaking in terms of uh, uh, fascism, he, he would have had a, a perhaps a more prophetic role. Uh, but, uh, I would add to, to an understanding of um, Pius XII's uh, uh, deep rootedness in, in what I would call the uh, diplomatic mentality. And uh, his vision of church leadership was very much uh, uh, one of diplomacy. Uh, and, and that's not to say uh, something completely negative, uh, but I think he conceived of his role as Pope of Rome of 
in a way that's not dissimilar from the way uh, many diplomats, particularly those who might be ambassadors or uh, council generals or so, uh, would envision their, their, their role. Uh, basically, uh, in the political world, the, what does a uh, ambassador or a, a politician do if, if they're a council general or have some other important office, it's to try to uh, get the best deal uh, for the uh, country they serve um, uh, in economics, in uh, military advantage, whatever. Um, now, the Pope's uh, goals in terms of papal diplomacy is somewhat different, were somewhat different, but nonetheless, followed some of the same patterns. In other words, I, I think, um, and again, I, I think you say this in the book, um, basically the Pope uh, was concerned about keeping, he really not, not only concerned, but he felt his responsibility was to keep the church alive uh, during a very difficult political situation. And why is that? Because the sacraments and availability of the sacraments were key to uh, final salvation. And the theology that dominated the church there was far more on eternal life than present day life. And that may be a little overstatement, but, but I think the, the theological thrust particularly was on the afterlife and gaining salvation. And if the, um, Ordinary faithful were uh, uh, incapable of uh, uh, receiving the sacraments and so on. This was something that would be a negative in terms of their ability to uh, gain uh, final salvation. So I think he saw he had to keep the church intact. Now, you know, there are many other things that um, I think uh, forged his um, approach to um, uh, governing in this very difficult period. Um, there's no question he had a certain affection for German, uh, matters German culture, uh, culturally uh, the German culture and so on. Uh, and I think that played some role, um, but I think he also, uh, he was afraid, he, he also had a commitment to a moral crusade. Uh, he had a commitment to uh, uh, trying to uh, protect Rome as a center of, uh, of uh, Christian culture. Uh, I think it's clear he had a uh, commitment to um, a Catholic view of the political uh, scene, whether in in Italy, uh, which I think in many cases he saw as a bastion, maybe the bastion of Catholic uh, social and political culture. Uh, and therefore he was afraid of its destruction, clearly had a, uh, a uh, fear of communist takeover. He even had a fear, I think, and you bring this out fairly well of um, uh, on occasion in the book um, of, um, the allies being dominated by um, uh, two countries in particular, neither of which had a strong, in his view, a strong uh, Catholic um, orientation. Uh, obviously the UK was seen as a bastion of the uh, Anglican church and the uh, uh, Italy, uh, I mean, the United States was seen particularly in Roos at Roosevelt as uh, a country whose ethos was largely dominated by, um, secu by the secular Protestant uh, elite together with the Jews. Uh, and so the Jews as a cultural, uh, as, pre as a kind of cultural entity and social political entity. And you get those comments uh, any number of times in the discussions. Um, for me, one of the things you have done well uh, is really put a um, context to uh, one of the uh, most discussed aspects of uh, 
Pius XII's uh, leadership during this period, and that is his um, unwillingness to say anything publicly about the uh, deportation of Jews to from Rome to uh, to Auschwitz, uh, and uh, people have tried to say, well, he he did encourage some of this. I mean, to give him his due, there, I I don't know of any evidence to suggest that those people in Italy in particular, uh, and, and noteworthy here would be some of the Catholic women's convents um, that did provide uh, a hiding place for Jews to take in Jews, um, that he never tried to stop that. He never tried to, as far as we can tell, uh, to stop uh, someone like the event, um, uh, John the 23rd from issuing um, fake um, baptismal certificates when he was uh, uh, the papal nuncio uh, in, uh, uh, and, and so on. So, you know, he, he never seemed to really be adamant against uh, efforts, but he never encouraged them. I mean, I think what you, um, what you show quite clearly in, in over 400, uh, some 484 pages is that, that Pius did not have the Jewish issue and, and the Hitlerian uh, attack on the Jews uh, as any kind of priority in, in his uh, governing uh, policy. Uh, occasionally he would do things now, uh, you know, one of the criticisms I read of a review of your book in Avenari the Italian uh, news, one of the Italian newspapers on the more conservative side is the um, reviewer says, well, you know, look uh, how popular Pius XII was. All these Jews were uh, uh, writing letters asking for the Pope's help and so on. Uh, well, that may be true. I'd be interested in, I don't know whether you have this information, whether the number of Jews that were writing in were in fact, quote unquote, baptized Jews, or whether they really were still uh, Jews. Uh, certainly there were some who were definitely st still within the Jewish community. But then the question comes up, not the fact that he, he got all these, but did he do anything to respond to them? And the answer is very, very little. Uh, uh, and so I think the final, judgment I have is um, is something that uh, I've, I've worked very strongly uh, on uh, together with some of my colleagues, such as a group of Catholic historians, um, including my colleague, uh, Kevin Spicer and others, uh, to really say Pius XII, however you finally evaluate him, uh, does not deserve canonization. And to go back for a second to uh, Cardinal George, um, I believe Cardinal George is one of the, um, uh, I can't prove it, I don't have a, a, a hard document uh, to prove this, but I think he is one of those who, uh, when the, when the uh, effort to canonize him was sort of at a high peak, uh, he was one of those who wrote uh, against the canonization. Uh, at least, uh, at least until survivors are deceased. Um, I, I'm not sure of that sex kind of limitation, but uh, I've heard that said. Uh, so, um, but I just would add one more point. Um, uh, I've sort of have, had a passion about this issue uh, that goes back to my um, uh, undergraduate days at Loyola University in Chicago, where in, uh, I minored in history and uh, studied under a, a professor named Edward Garvin, who eventually went to the University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison. And Gargan was very passionate on this issue. He, his field was modern German history. And he was very passionate about uh, this, um, this question of Pius XII and, and really quite critical of the lack of not only the leadership of Pius XII, but also the, uh, 
the involvement of, of so many uh, other church leaders, whether it was Schuster and Milan and others, uh, in, in working with the, if not so much with the uh, Nazis, with the uh, Italian fascists and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, he really promoted the work of Luigi, Dom Luigi Sterzo and others. Uh, well, during that time, also present on the faculty was Gordon Zahn who really wrote the first book uh, sort of challenging um, uh, the uh, attitudes of Catholics uh, towards Nazism and, and suffered tremendously as a result of his thesis, especially in, in Germany, and but also in the Vatican. Because uh, when I uh, was the student there of Gargan and so on, um, the Vatican had, um, sent Cardinal Bea uh, to Chicago to meet with the president of Loyola, who was a Jesuit, um, to press him to fire Gordon Zahn for his uh, critique of the German Catholic Church. Now that's not too well known, but it became a, a real issue for some of us who were students at the time. The editor, of the student newspaper at the time was someone named Peter Steinfeld, uh, who went on to, among other things, edit Commonweal, uh, be the, for many years, the religion writer, main religion writer for the New York Times and so on. But Steinfeld organized an effort to uh, protect Gordon Zahn, which turned out to be successful in the, uh, the the leadership of Loyola University resisted the Vatican's effort to get uh, Gordon's on fire. And uh, that, uh, that involvement was very, very central in shaping my own uh, commitment to this whole question. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, you brought up all sorts of issues and um, I know the people probably uh, tuning into us uh, cover a wide range from some who are really expert, others who probably uh, don't know a whole lot about this history. Um, but you know, getting at that, this figure of Pius XII in the war and his silence during the Holocaust, which is what the, you know, the controversy is primarily focused on. I mean, as I, I try to show in my book, um, you know, as you rightly say, he was, his background was not, not pastoral, it was political. I mean, he was in the Vatican Secretary of State, essentially from the time he became a priest. Um, and he spent 12 years in Germany before becoming a cardinal uh, from 1917 to 1929, um, in which he felt particularly comfortable with the, you might say, conservative Catholic elite at the time, not the Nazis, but the conservative Catholic elite at the time. He had great affection for them. He became fluent in German. Uh, but at the beginning of the war, there was good reason for him to think that the Nazis were likely to win the war. Uh, if you think of their going from success to success, and especially in uh, not only what happened in 1938 with Auschwitz, with taking over Austria, then 39, uh, marching through Poland in a few weeks, but 1940, the spring of 1940, marching westward, taking over Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and France, all within about a month. Uh, and it looked like, uh, not to mention North Africa, the Balkans, and so on, that uh, that Hitler is going to win the war. And so from the Pope's point of view, and given his kind of political cast of mind, the way uh, John has referred to it, uh, he saw his first duty, I think, as how do I protect the institutional church in a Europe that's dominated by Hitler and his pal Mussolini. Later on, this is you know, somewhat capsulizing the, uh, the explanation of the, in my book and the account of the historical events, but Later on, it became evident or pretty clear that the Allies were going to win the war as they began marching into Europe, including in Italy from the south uh, up. The Pope had a different fear. It was a fear um, that Germany was going to lose the war and that the, uh, of course, when we talk about the Allies, the Soviet Union is one of the major allies. And uh, the Pope's fear was that if Germany uh, is totally destroyed by the war, uh, that the uh, communism would try, triumph. So now the fear is not that there's going to be Nazi control of Europe, but that there'll be a communist control of Europe. And so the Pope was eager to try to bring about a compromise peace, uh, which the Allies were rejecting, of course, saying only uh, 
the uh, total uh, surrender, unconditional surrender of the Axis powers uh, within the war. Uh, so, and then there was one other issue which I discovered in these newly opened archives that the Pope had, had this other concern later in the war. And that is that if he were seen to be doing anything to promote the defeat of the Nazis, uh, including denouncing what they were doing to the Jews, that uh, the, the Catholics in Germany uh, would blame him in part for their defeat. And thinking about what had happened in, in World War I and the German attitudes toward kind of stab in the back and, and so on, being betrayed, uh, he was worried that uh, he and, and the, the uh, Holy See would be blamed in part for the a Nazi or the German defeat in World War II if he were to be seen to uh, do anything critical of them. So I think you know, these, these are all um, you know, important to keep in mind and understanding what in some sense to me is very dramatic, and especially uh, John mentioned October 16th. So October 16th, 1943, the Germans occupied much of Italy, including Rome, the previous month. And uh, Hitler sends 350 SS to Rome to round up their task is to round up all the Jews of Rome to be sent to their death at, at Auschwitz. Uh, October 16th, they go door to door with these lists of all the Jews uh, in Rome. And um, they round up initially about 1260 of them. They put them in a holding area, military college right outside Vatican City. And they keep them there for two days. Uh, and of course, this puts the Pope in a, what he sees as a very awkward position. Um, and I won't go into all the details here, but um, a couple of things. One is two days later, uh, a little over a thousand, about 1,017 of these uh, Jews are put on a train directly for Auschwitz, where they're going to be met by Joseph Mengele, the uh, Nazi doctor, who will order immediately two thirds of them directly to the gas chamber that same day. Uh, the others, most of them would uh, die later, all about 16 or 17 would uh, would survive the war out of the over a thousand sent. Pope never objected publicly to this. And he, but what did happen, get at another of your points, John, about the baptismal question. Uh, why, if they rounded up 1260 Jews on October 16th, why were only a little over a thousand put on that train two days later? Who were the other 250? who were let go. And why did they take two days to process them? Well, a good part of that explanation is that they were checking their baptismal credentials. Uh, since those who argue, oh, Nazis, for them, it was, you know, religion didn't enter, it was race. Well, in fact, that's not true. It's a great simplification. And certainly not true in the Italian case where the Nazis did not want to offend the Pope and embarrass them further. So not only did they release all those who could prove they were baptized, all the Jews who could prove they had been baptized, and there had been a great rush to the baptismal font in previous years, given the, the persecution of the Jews. Um, but even those Jewish men married to Catholic women who had children who were baptized, um, they were let go as well because they were supporting a Catholic family. And, and uh, again, the Nazis didn't want to offend the, the Pope. So uh, there's, you know, when we talk about the morality versus the politics of the situation, I tried to emphasize the first part of these, this response, uh, the kind of political factors that would keep the Pope silent. But the you know, question is, what is the role of a Pope? And uh, obviously the Pope has many roles, uh, but uh, as I say in the kind of afterword of my book, I try to keep any judgment, judgment out of the uh, main text, which I've tried to recount what, what actually happened uh, in the kind of you were there away. But at the end, I, I conclude that uh, if you want to judge the Pope politically as protector of the institutional church, uh, there's a lot that could be said for him in a difficult time. If you want to see him, uh, to use uh, John's uh, terminology as a more prophetic or more moral uh, leadership, uh, I would judge him a failure. You know, John, it sounds like perhaps you agree with that general conclusion. Uh, I would uh, basically agree with him. That's the reason why I don't think he deserves canonization. Uh, you know, it, it, part of it was he lived in a uh, uh, an atmosphere that is considerably different from what we have today. Uh, this has been pointed out by a few historians that 
you know, there was no human rights um, perspective that was really strong in Catholicism prior to Vatican II. And I think um, the evaluation of Pius XII um, is in the light of, I think, the church's self-understanding after Vatican II, and therefore the failure to really come out uh, in terms of the protection of human rights, whether it was Jews or whether, for example, the other group that was angry at uh, Pius XII were the Polish Catholics, uh, who were very angry that Pius XII didn't give uh, uh, really seem to be interested in helping them and protecting them. Um, so th that's one thing that uh, we have a different moral perspective now. And I sometimes have co uh, contrasted um, what how Pius XII acted and how the bishops in the small African country of Malawi uh, acted uh, during the presidential uh, tenure of uh, one uh, Hastings Banda. Uh, Banda at one point said he was going to kill all the uh, people who uh, followed indigenous um, religious practices. And the bishops of, uh, of Malawi, which I think were seven in number, uh, I believe all or except maybe one were still expatriate bishops. That was as they were not uh, indigenous to Malawi. Uh, they came out and said, uh, you can't do this. And then Banda said, well, if, um, if uh, you criticize me and you try to stop me, I will uh, close down the churches. I will uh, kill your uh, priests and catechists and he was rather serious, uh, I would say dead serious. Um, and now the British and the Americans did lobby him to try to tone down. But uh, the bishop, those bishops uh, took a, a kind of posture uh, at the risk of, of having the uh, destruction uh, of the institutional church in Malawi uh, take place. Uh, but they felt that they, and they did it to protect the, um, the human rights, the human dignity of people who weren't even part of their, their own church. These were the um, people who followed indigenous uh, African religion. So that is such a contrast, I think, in leadership. Now, I'm not equating uh, being a bishop in Malawi with having, you know, the papal role, but I think there, there's a contrast there. But even you have this picture in the book, photo in the book of Pius XII's um, installation as Pope being carried uh, on the, uh, uh, say the, the, the story. The story. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, I, you know, I, when I was reading that, it was the time when there was this, the Pope was in Canada and there was one, this one photograph of, of Francis sitting in a, in a wheelchair on the side of a lake by himself. And, mm -hmm. and to me, the contrast between um, Francis and uh, Pius XII in terms of e the fundamental ethos of what it means to be a Pope uh, was so stark. Uh, the church, I mean, that's why um, I think you're dwelling on Mussolini uh, you, you brought out how much the church was so, and not just Pius XII, but so many of the bishops uh, and so on were just entwined with the fascist uh, uh, party and so on. Uh, and the church uh, just had this um, central involvement in the political life of the country. Now, it, it, it may be inevitable that if the church is going to have its world headquarters in Rome, it's going to be involved in Italian politics. We have a new challenge right now with the recent elections in Italy and the restoration of at least a kind of uh, uh, semi-fascism into the government of how Francis is going to handle his relationship with the new uh, Italian leader. Uh, but uh, we'll, we will see on that. 
but I, I think it'd be the way it was the, the uh, clearly the church's alliance with the um, Italian political scene was in my judgment, uh, well overdone and in the end hurtful for the moral leadership that Pius and other bishops in, uh, in Italy uh, should have provided to the uh, Italian people. I think, um, well, I think actually maybe a time where we want to open things up for yeah. questions. Yeah. I don't know whether Ken exactly. Can that. exactly what I was thinking, Swami. Uh, thank you both. And we encourage people to ask more questions. There are some here, some that have already, I think, been answered looking at the question of morality versus politics and how that played out in the Pope's Catholicism. Um, you know, just to, to piggyback on one thing that you, that you that uh, John was just talking about, and David, you mentioned your book, which I thought was really good about you put the facts first, and then at the end, you have a lot of discussion of what it really means. And one thing you pointed out there was that 75 years after the end of World War II, the bishops in Germany uh, basically acknowledged their failure to oppose Nazism and to speak out for Jews. And you all noted that the Vatican and the Italian bishops haven't done something similar. So uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, the, um, the uh, John referred to the the review of my book, if you can call that, because I actually don't think the person, although they devoted a full page to this, actually read the book. Uh, but in the newspaper of uh, L'Avenire, which is the newspaper of um, the, basically of the church hierarchy in Italy. And uh, two days before that came out, because my book came out in Italian a couple of weeks before the uh, American English uh, language version. Uh, two days before that review appeared, the Vatican daily newspaper, L'Azzaratore Romano, I uh, devoted a full page to denouncing my book. And what I take this as, and I'm sorry to say that something similar appeared in the American Jesuit magazine, America, uh, gave my book to a, a reviewer who described himself as a, a proponent of the canonization of Pius XII. So I guess they knew what they were gonna get when they gave this person my book to review. But um, it does bring up this stark contrast between those this is not you know, the church versus someone else. It's actually within the church that just as the church hierarchy in Germany has called for the uh, German church to come to terms with its failures during World War II, I think the same thing has happened in the French church and, and others, we're talking about the Roman Catholic church, but neither the Vatican itself nor the church in Italy, which I think has a lot to answer for in this regard, as John has indicated, uh, has been willing to, to come to terms with this history. And so those of us, who um, you know? Who try to recount this history to get at what actually happened? Uh, are you know called names or um, dismissed in various ways and vilified in various ways? So it's um, I think it's unfortunate. I'm, you know, might, one might have hoped under Pope Francis that this might change. On the other hand, Pope Francis um, you know has so many battles to fight. And this doesn't seem to be you know, near the top of his list of issues he wants to really wade in for. And the other thing to be said about that is that the main, uh, those who feel so strongly about Pius XII as a great heroic, courageous figure are, in my uh, experience, uh, mostly those who also are very critical of Francis. That is, Pius XII is a heroic figure because he's the last pre-Second Vatican Council Pope and from a Jewish point of view, pre uh, Nostra Aetate Pope. Uh, and uh, if you go on Twitter, you see that any day there'll be dozens of tweets which say Pius XII was the last Pope. Yes. After Pius XII, there's no Pope, they're all illegitimate. You know, yeah. John the 23rd, they all went off this liberal direction that uh, uh, away from the you know, revealed truths and so on. So, um, you know, this does get at, at uh, battles going on within the, the church uh, today as well. All right, so let me combine two questions which are very similar. Uh, one, somebody who read your book, uh, he says, it's excellent. He said, he's not an expert in the area, but the thing that stunned me the most was that the casual anti-Semitism much of the church well before the Holocaust, and another that's very similar, he said, how should we think about the longstanding anti-Jewish teachings and activities of the Catholic church prior, prior to uh, Pius XII? in shaping the pious response to Nazi action. 
is anti-Judaism a systemic institutional institute, uh, part of the historic Catholic Church? Obviously, things have changed with Vatican II, but I think the, you know this is pre-Vatican II. So, what are your thoughts about that, David? Yeah, the well, first of all, it's important from to realize, uh, of course, Pius XII was Italian, was Roman uh, at the time. The Curia consisted the church leadership. Uh, central leadership consisted of about 24 cardinals, 23 Italian. So it was very heavily Italian institution. And uh, Mussolini had introduced the racial laws in 1938. So now we're talking before the war. Um, and the racial laws are these strict uh, anti-Semitic uh, actions. They threw all Jewish children out of the schools, fired all Jewish professors and teachers, fired all Jewish members of civil service, and on and on, uh, impoverished the Jews of Italy. And um, in trying to justify this, because unlike the Nazis, for whom, of course, anti-Semitism was written into their DNA, this hadn't been true of Italian fascism. And to justify it, uh, one of the major rationales given was that we are just doing what the popes had uh, and church councils had called on uh, good Catholics to do for centuries and did, the popes did, as long as they had control politically of uh, the papal states and of Rome. Uh, so, uh, we, and one, and another thing I would mention is that, um, and, and this, the, the church never objected to this, never at the time, never lodged objections to this uh, use. Uh, their only objection to the racial laws was that they were being applied in part to people who they thought should be regarded as Catholics, namely baptized, recently baptized Jews. Um, we do discover in the newly opened Vatican archives that the, main, the man the Pope regarded as his main advisor on Jews, uh, Monsignor Angelo Dell'Acqua, who would go on to become Cardinal Vicar of Rome, uh, was giving him advice which was laced with pretty virulent anti-Semitism. Uh, and this was prevalent. I, you know, I, the only thing I could say, and if this is I won't say an excuse, but maybe putting in context that anti-Semitism was pretty widespread. It wasn't just in the church. Um, I grew up in Westchester and when I was growing up there, the two main local institutions was the local you know, book club and the local golf club, neither one allowed Jews in. Um, so, uh, you know, unfortunately the church uh, was not only not immune, but was being used um, not only in, in Italy, but also elsewhere in, in Europe where the persecution of Jews was taking place to to help uh, justify that persecution. Thank you. If I can add. Okay. Sure, John. Um, I, I think one issue, one, one issue I would maybe take a little very mild, um, uh, but give it a little mild critique of is um, your discussion of the Vatican document we remember. Uh, and it would be more not on what you, in a way what you say are the defects of it, which are extremely, uh, pronounced in my judgment, but the intent, Cardinal Cassidy's intent uh, was, because I knew Cassidy very well and talked to him personally about his struggle with the uh, CDF, the uh, Vatican Office on Doctrine, headed at the time by Joseph Ratzinger. And practically every, I would say, every one of the most objectionable parts of the of that document were uh, forced upon the text, uh, Cassidy's text by um, CDF. And he was told that uh, unless you accept these, the document will not be released. And he made a very difficult judgment. As, and he, his conclusion was he felt that uh, it was important, since, especially since the Pope had uh, promised such a document almost a a decade before um, that um, uh, it might uh, really lead to the Catholic Church and Catholic schools taking up the Holocaust question in a way they had not done so previously. But uh, I mean, I, I, I would also mention uh, in terms of the general issue, uh, I, I, it, uh, there is going to be an issue of anti sem Semitism Studies, uh, which comes out, which is edited in Canada, published by Indiana University Press. The October issue, which comes out on October 28, features a symposium around a, an article I was asked to submit 
And there are five Catholic respondents. And the whole question is, has the Catholic Church eliminated anti-Semitism? And my answer is not completely. And it really won't until it really grapples with this fundamental thesis of St. Augustine uh, that Jews uh, are to bear witness um, through marginality, not, not through personal destruction, but through suffering and marginality in society to what it means when you don't accept Christ and the suffering you endure. Uh, and some of the same uh, understanding of the church's position is now articulated by an Orthodox Jewish scholar, um, Karma ben Yohan. The book has gotten a fair amount of attention. Uh, Jacob's younger brother, uh, the Christian Jewish relate Christian Jewish relations after Vatican II, and um, there's a there's a kind of a, a real uh, uh, congruence between her central thesis and uh, at least in the first half of the book, which is on the Catholic response. Uh, she's also. Uh, presents John, if I if I could jump in for a second, we have about three minutes left. Okay. I do want I got to a couple other questions, yeah, so we could sure. go on for a long time. But I want to. Uh, so one thing quickly, David, that I thought was interesting way you put it at the end. You talked at the beginning of your uh, book about the archives being closed, but you make at the end a, a larger allegation. Uh, and if you could talk for about just about a minute or so, but you said it was a well scrubbed historical narrative. So it wasn't just they weren't opening up, but you thought that they were it was trying to to actually change history. Well, it's um, I, I didn't mean that the archival um, documents were being you know, altered in any right. way. Although those that were published in those 12 volumes, there were excisions made of, of for example, anti Semitic language and, and so on, as well as the fact certain documents that would have been regarded as embarrassing were not published that we now know. Um, now the well scrubbed narrative I think is in part what uh, John, I'm not sure all uh, people tuning in know what we remember is, but it was a statement, uh, what was it, 1998 maybe, Thank that you. The, um, the church under John Paul II came up with in response to these criticisms of, you know, did the church have any responsibility for the anti-Semitism that could have made the Holocaust possible and that document answers that emphatic no, that there was traditional, what they call anti-religious, uh, anti-Jewish uh, religious sentiment, but that had nothing to do with modern anti-Semitism, which is what led to the Holocaust. And so the well-scrubbed narrative, I and mean, that's part of what I would regard as a well-scrubbed narrative. Uh, and that's also, I think, explains the rather strident reaction in certain segments uh, of the Catholic world to my book, that it, um, we're st we have a narrative, we're sticking to it. These uh, documents and this evidence, we, you know, we're not going to pay any attention to it. Great. Thank well, you. I mean, finally, I finally, John, okay, just for one second, we have like one minute left and I want to get to two other questions. So, um... okay, well, I was just going to say the, the Vatican sending Bea to Loyola was an example also of trying to control the narrative. Control the narrative. Thank, thank you. So I want to combine two things. Uh, one, and this gets to the end of your book again, sort of like the what if. Uh, one question is, how, uh, how would the Vatican have fared if Pius had taken a strong position against Mussolini or Hitler's policies against the Jews? And then I want to combine that with something that struck me, because you said that, you know, you speculated the Pope had spoken out um, about the, the treatment of the Jews, many people who were participating in the extermination saw themselves as good Catholics. So if you had that that papal uh, saying, no, this isn't what a good Catholic is, what you know difference would that have made? And it made me also think about the response to that would have been, wait a minute, if he had said that, you know, would he have been seen as sort of a creature of the Jews? Right. So the, um, I mean, this is another part of understanding the Holocaust. You know, who was it who was murdering all these Jews in the Holocaust? They were not people, for the most part, who thought of themselves as pagans. They thought of themselves as Christian, I mean, whether not, obviously not just Catholics, but Protestants of various types as well. So, um, you know, I think th those of us who are looking back anyway, it would uh, criticize the Pope for not speaking out. This is part of the issue uh, that now, in terms of what impact it would have had, you know, this kind of conjectural history, I do think the Italian and the German situation are different. Um, Germany, first of all, there were more 
Protestants and Catholics. It wasn't a Catholic country, although there was probably over 40% of the population was Catholic. Uh, and as I mentioned, not only was the Pope Italian, but almost all the curia, the central administration of the church was Italian, and 99% more or less of the Italian population were Roman Catholic. So I think, and the other issue there is um, Mussolini had a problem to convince the Italians to enter the war. They weren't uh, enthusiastic in general about Hitler. Uh, they weren't that enthusiastic about Ar the idea of Aryan supremacy. They just fought a war against Germany you know, 20 years or so before. And so um, the church hierarchy, the same church hierarchy whose paper denounced my book um, is this church hierarchy that said all good Catholics need to they do their fair part in the taking part in the war, namely the war aside Hitler. And the church has never come to terms with that. Great. Thank you. And we can go on for a lot longer, but maybe <laughs> we'll find some other occasion to reconvene and talk about so many issues here just generally. And I, I congratulate you again for a wonderful book. I encourage everybody to read it. It's uh, it, it's worth the 400 and some odd pages. And John, thank you for participating with us. It's always great to uh, see you and be in conversation with you too. So thank you both very much. Thank everybody for attending and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.